This is the 2023 Apple Mac Studio with the M2 Max chip. While it might seem mostly the same as the 2022 version with the M1 Max, there are a few things in here that not a lot of people have been talking about that make a huge difference over the previous generation. I think sometimes we focus on benchmarks we're all familiar with like CPU and GPU performance, which definitely do have value. You want a fast performance chip, no doubt, but we can tend to ignore some things that make more of a difference that sit outside of those common specs. Today we're going to take a first look at this machine and dive into those details along with everything else, both good and bad, and how it stacks up against some comparable options. So if you're curious about the new Mac Studio and what it has to offer, stick around and let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. I've been a huge fan of the newest desktop Macs. They have a lot to offer, whether you're using them for productivity, creative work, software development, you name it. And for me personally, I tend to use them for all of the above. The Mac Studio is interesting to me because there are times when I use a lot of system resources when I'm creating content like this, or I'm working in apps that demand a lot for my machine in both power and external accessories. And this is the only Mac, in my opinion, that I can probably get away without using any add-ons. For the past six months or so, I've been using the M2 Pro Mac Mini, which has been a great machine and by itself can accomplish most of what I need to do. But there are still some accessories that I need to pair up with it to make my workflow feel right. Although there are a decent number of ports on the back of the mini, there's no SD card slot and no front inputs at all. With the Mac Studio, I've got an expanded port selection where on the front there's both a UHS-2 SD card reader and two USB-C ports capable of 10 gigabits per second. And then if you move to the back, there's four Thunderbolt 4 ports, a 10 gigabit ethernet connection, two USB-A ports, an HDMI port, and a 3.5 millimeter audio jack. The thing that I love about the port selection is that unlike the Mac Mini, you've got that 3.5 millimeter audio output beside the other ports and not below them. So it's a little bit less awkward to plug in. And also just speaking to the additional ports on the front, out of all the ports that I use, the SD slot is probably the one that I touch the most. And because I've got quick access to the two front USB-C ports, I could probably ditch the Thunderbolt hub that sits at my desk. If I would have got the studio with the M2 Ultra in it, those front USB-C ports would have been bumped up to Thunderbolt 4, but the four connections at the back of this model are fine for me as I'm usually just plugging in external SSDs to those and just leave them plugged in to expand my storage a little bit. That wasn't always the case as the pre-2023 Max did have a little bit of a weak spot with HDMI where the HDMI port would only support 4K up to 60 Hertz or if you were on a 1440p ultra wide, that would top out at 100 Hertz. That meant if you did have something with a high refresh rate, you were almost always using up a Thunderbolt port, which is what I did anytime that I ran and ultra wide with my machines. And with the new M2 Pro and Max chips, it's something that you no longer need to worry about. The HDMI port in the 2023 Mac Studio can support up to 240 Hertz over 4K and can now do variable refresh rates, which is gonna make a lot more sense for folks with higher performing displays. It's still gonna support up to five displays like last year, which makes sense given you really only have five ports that can handle display output. But I doubt that's something that most people are gonna be concerned with. Beyond the ports, there isn't much that's notable about the design. It's basically just a taller version of the Mac Mini. And the one thing that I didn't even think about was where I was gonna place this. My desk riser is just a hair too short for this to effectively fit where the Mini is. Whoops. So I guess it's technically not as versatile as that machine in terms of where you can place it. But I did happen to make this shelf, so I'm just gonna cut some new legs and it should be fine. Speaking of placing this on a desk, an underrated thing about this studio is that if you flip it upside down, you actually get a surface for this machine to sit on. You can see this black material along the edge on the bottom where on the mini, there is nothing. If you watch my M2 Pro Mac mini review, you'll know that I put these little silicon tabs on to prevent it from scratching. So it's nice to not have to worry about that on the studio. The design does leave a lot of room for heat dissipation for the more powerful M2 Max chip that's inside here, which is a slight improvement over last year's M1 Max. This is a base model, so it's got a 12 core CPU and 30 core GPU, where last year's M1 Max base had a 10 core CPU and 24 core GPU. So there is more power there. There are tons of benchmarks available and videos showing the difference between the two with the M2 Max already being available in the MacBook Pros for a while now. CPU performance, I think is anywhere between 
14 and 20% faster. There's a pretty big boost to the media engine where the M2 Max can potentially be a lot faster than the M1 Max. That all depends on the codec and the app that you're working with, but you will see a bit of an upgrade to most things nonetheless. If you compare the M2 Max to the M2 Pro, the CPU performance is relatively the same, but anything GPU related, things like 3D modeling, video editing, or dealing with motion graphics does feel a lot smoother on the Max. I have done some limited testing and I found render times in Final Cut Pro to be twice as fast as on the M2 Pro, which makes sense given that this has two encoders versus the one that's in the M2 Pro. Also, things like Blender renders have been substantially quicker and in some other practical tests, I found things to be a lot more snappy on the M2 Max where the M2 Pro wants to tap out. Recently, I put together a wallpaper set that was all done on the M2 Pro and for all the cover photos that I'd use for the marketing material, I basically crammed about 500 megabytes of uncompressed wallpapers into a single file within Affinity Photo. The M2 Pro got really laggy the more stuff I put in there, and if I go to move things around, it would often slow down quite a bit. So one of the first things that I wanted to do was open up that file on the Mac Studio and see how it responded and everything was smooth as butter. There's no question that the M2 Max is a lot more powerful than the Pro, but for the things that I've tried, it's almost instantly noticeable, provided that you have something that you feel friction on on the M2 Pro or is super demanding. But there is one thing on the Mac Studio that is substantially slower than the Mac Mini that I have here. That is gonna be something that a lot of people are likely gonna get hung up on, the SSD speed. This studio has the base 512 gig SSD that is considerably slower than the options above it. In fact, my Mac Mini M2 Pro has the one terabyte drive that is much, much faster than the base option in the Mac Studio about twice as fast, but I think that spec is a little overblown if I'm being completely honest. During my time with the Mac Mini, I tried running different apps and processes on the internal drive versus my external Thunderbolt drive that has a similar speed to the one that's in the Mac Studio. And I gotta say, for me, it really doesn't make any distinguishing difference which drive I use. Whether I'm photo or video editing, doing software development, whatever it is I never found using an external drive like this to feel any slower. And I've honestly just went back to running everything from an external SSD most of the time to offload a lot of the mileage from the internal components since they aren't replaceable, which is why I'm fine with these base drives. It's interesting that we can get so caught up in these drive specs when the majority of us won't feel the bottlenecks there, but there are some things that affect us every day that are more widely ignored. The big one for me is wireless connectivity. One of the reasons why I love my M2 Pro Mac Mini is because it has Bluetooth 5.3 and Wi-Fi 6E, where the machines before it, including the 2022 Mac Studio, had Bluetooth 5.0 and Wi-Fi 6. Bluetooth 5.3 is a pretty big step forward in its own right, but if you have a Wi-Fi 6E router or mesh system, or even a Wi-Fi 6 system, these new modems are a lot faster. Every device that I've tested on my one gigabit network connection that's come equipped with Wi-Fi 6E usually sees an increase of about two to 300 megabits per second, which is a pretty substantial amount. And the 2023 Mac Studio does have those same network upgrades that came with all the new Macs that released earlier this year. For most of us, a faster network connection is gonna be way more valuable and practical than some of these other specs. Your network connection and internet speed is usually the bottleneck of your system at some point during the day, whether that's uploading or downloading content, pulling down repositories if you're coding, you name it. There's probably a time during the day where you're waiting on something. I did have some initial issues with Wi-Fi 6E on the 2023 Max when they first came out, where they would drop out of the six gigahertz band and revert back to the five gig one on Wi-Fi 6. But for the past couple of months, it seems to have stabilized and I haven't had any trouble with that since, including my brief time with this Mac Studio. But even if you're on Wi-Fi 6 or you only have a Wi-Fi 6 capable network, they still seem to outperform the machines that top out at Wi-Fi 6. That fast Faster connection speed has saved me countless hours during my time with the M2 Pro Mac Mini, and I just really think that if you're looking for a new Mac and you've got a high-speed network, that alone can be a reason why you might want to look at the 2023 Mac Studio over the last gen. Having said that, I know that's not a priority for everyone, and it'd be remiss of me if I didn't mention that because the new M2 Mac Studio was just released, the price of the refurbished M1 Mac Studios have dropped on the Apple refurb site. You can pick up an M1 Mac's base Mac Studio for just over $1,500. USD, which is a great deal. You will miss out on some of the things that I just mentioned, but if you're looking for a performant machine and you don't want to fork out the two grand for the latest model, it's worth checking out. I'm going to have more on this Mac Studio and the new 15-inch MacBook Air when I've had time to dig into these a little more and get into some real-world tests that can hopefully provide everyone with a lot of value. And the cool thing is I'll have the entire lineup of the M2 chips except for the Ultra, so I'm looking forward to help define the lines where it makes sense to purchase some of these models over other 
matters from a practical standpoint. If you have anything regarding those comparisons that you'd like to see or anything that you wanna know about the Mac Studio or the 15 inch Air, let me know in the comments down below. Or if you have the Mac Studio, let me know how you're liking it. That's it for me today. If you enjoyed this video or you found it useful, feel free to hit that like button. If you wanna see more tech related content or play hide and seek with me in a room that's completely empty, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.